Good morning, everyone. Is this thing on? Yeah. Is it on? You can hear me? Oh, good, good. Fantastic. Good to see you all and good morning to those who are watching uh, through uh, Zoom today. And uh, I'm excited. I'm not sure about you. I hope you are. It's good to be with the brothers. Pray that we all can really be focused today and uh, enjoy every part of the service. Let's start with singing. I'd like to share a few verses from God's word, a way of, uh, in a way to introduce uh, the sermon today. Uh, Greg is going to talk about repentance and also having faith in Jesus. Remember last week, I was looking at a certain number of questions from the Westminster Confession, and uh, Greg is going to continue on week that we have two things to do in order to come to Christ. One is to repent, and secondly, have faith in what Jesus has done on the cross. And I think uh, from there on, Greg is going to talk and encourage us. So I thought of a prayer by Nehemiah. Nehemiah was in exile in Persia. He was actually born there, and then um, he was praying because he wanted to go, go back uh, and, and the temple and, and all that. So he had to go and have permission from the king. So in order to do that, he had to pray. And these are the words uh, he said, which is really in line of the theme of today. He said, Lord, the God of heaven, uh, sorry, I'm reading from chapter one. Sorry, it is Nehemiah, chapter one, Nehemiah one, verse five. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his commandment, he, sorry, who keeps his covenant of love. Really the original language is his covenant of mercy. Keeps his covenant of mercy with those who love him and to keep his command and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, the sins we have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them my name. Verse 10, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in, uh, in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor, praying that God will give favor to him in the eyes of the king. And the king actually answered, yes, you can go and, uh, and help your people. So he went back to Jerusalem to, uh, to organize how to rebuild the... And what I can see there, this is so applicable to us. Uh, he's calling God, uh, God of heaven, so he's really acknowledging and uh, he's saying that you keep your covenant. And in his confession, he made a confession that was national, communal, and the personal confession. And he is holding God to his covenant and he's hold, holding God to his words. And I think we, we do the same thing. Jesus said, um, uh, yeah, the Bible says in, in John 3, 16, very well known on the son that whoever believes in him 
will never perish, but will have eternal life. This is the promise. So if you come to Jesus, you have eternal life. And God is faithful, and he keeps his promises. So that's what um, Nehemiah was saying to God in his prayer. You are faithful. You are, you are God of covenant. We hold God to his promises. He said, come to me. You will never perish, but you have, have eternal pride. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that we are here to worship you, whether here uh, in body or uh, watching through um, through Zoom. Lord, Lord, we come together to give you glory and to praise your name. Also, Lord, on behalf of my brothers and sisters here today, we come to confess our sins, just what, like what Nehemiah said, and he without Jesus we are sinners and we are condemned forever so we come to you today because of our weaknesses and our shortcomings though we know what is expected of us yet being in the flesh being in the world we still commit sin so Lord I pray for myself and others here today that you may have mercy upon us and they forgive our sins, Lord. Lord, we, um, we ask you that not because of any credits we have, but on the basis of the blood which is being shed on the cross for us. You loved us so much that you died for our sins and you have taken the curse which was we were deserved, you took it on yourself. So. So Lord, only for the name of Jesus we pray. Thank you, Lord, that you promised that if we come to you and confess our sins, you are faithful and just, and you will forgive our sins and purify us from all uh, ungodliness. Lord, we thank you for your promises to us. And we thank you, Lord, that we are uh, still holding you on your promise that one day you'll come back and take us to you and your crucifixion you're praying to your father and he said that you want to take us to be where you're going to be so lord we looking forward to that we pray lord for the um for the rest of the of the time we spend it together that this would be a blessed time for everyone here we pray that in jesus name amen let me look at the announcements Okay, while most COVID-19 safety rules have been lifted, if you are not feeling well, uh, you better stay home or you can uh, watch us on Zoom. Please remember to sign in at the door when you come in. Uh, masks will again need to be worn indoors until the end of January. Right, every Sunday, there is a time of prayer before the quarter past nine, so half an hour. We, we meet together in the back hall, and we just pray for the service for the day and the, the people who are leading us. So if you love to join us, you can join us at any time within this hour. Uh, if you like to volunteer to serve on Sunday, please put your name down. In the foyer, there is a sheet of paper on the foyer there. Please put your name down again to help me organizing the roster for next year or for this year, really. If you are good with numbers, we need a treasurer. Herma, God bless her heart. She's been doing this job for years and years and years. So if someone really good at that and wants to be trained and, uh, and help it to take over he's still in annual leave until the end of this month until the 30th of january any any other announcements no more announcements okay all right uh, uh sorry sorry <laughs> so in in regards to people volunteering we just need a few more volunteers for the cleaning roster um there's some um, uh 
sort of guidelines on the wall in the foyer there. And uh, it's just a matter of popping your name down. So for February, we have um, two couples coming to do the general cleaning. And we still need someone to do the, the toilet cleaning. So the toilet cleaning, the toilets need to be cleaned every fortnight. And that's why it's on the general cleaning plus just the toilet cleaning. So it's just a matter of popping your name in there. You only need one or two people to clean the toilets. And uh, it's good to have at least three, preferably four people to do the general cleaning for the church. Uh, the more the merrier, the lighter the load. So if we, I'll just keep that in the foyer, pop it back out there. Thank you. And I think, um, Benjamin, so if we can just make sure we pop them back on the tray and not on the organ there because it's um, doing something to the wood. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Jenny. Morning, everyone. Morning, those on Zoom. Uh, just a friendly reminder about a um, COVID uh, protocol of cleaning our church. Um, don't really uh, use the church throughout the week, so just the normal things like switches, handles, pews, um, not so much to kitchen and um yeah just um yeah if we go to uh party with that thank you thank you jonathan ben uh kids come to the front and jared is going to uh share with the kids today okay well good morning kids how are we going not too bad and those on Zoom as well, if there's any on Zoom. Okay, so uh, we come to uh, Ephesians chapter six, and I'll just read it briefly. Um, so uh, this verse is uh, of Ephesians six. This is where Paul is telling the Christians at a place called Ephesus. That's right. Very good. So, so he's telling uh, the, the people at Ephesus to fight against evil and to follow Jesus. Okay, so that's to, to fight against evil and to follow Jesus. And here's how he tells them to do it. So this is from verse 13. Uh, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. And then today we come to, as, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Okay. Now, what happens when you fight? When you fight with your sibling, okay, I'm sure it's happened once at least, okay? If you fight with your sibling, with your brother or your sister, when your parents come in, what do they do? Do they? they say. And if, they can, if you continue to fight, what happens? If the parents have to come in a second time, what happens then if you keep fighting? You get in trouble, what else? You get a punishment, yes. And what, what we would do is that we would probably put you in your rooms and separate you so that um, you just play by yourself. Now, in that situation, you get separated. You probably prefer to be playing together, okay? Because fighting separates people. Fighting separates people. Okay, and I'm going to be saying fighting a few times. So when I say fight, when I say fight, I need you to do this. Okay, I would have done a bit more action, but you know, for safety reasons, I just prefer to do this. So every time I say fight or fighting, okay, you do that. Jonah, can you do that? Okay, all right, so let's try it. Fighting separates people. And one of the churches Paul wrote a letter to, the Ephesus church, we talked about Ephesus earlier, they were also fighting. Yes, very good. Okay. They were also fighting. They were fighting about what the Bible said. The church is saying lies about the Bible. They were also fighting uh, because people were still um, not following. Some were following Jesus, others were not. And so they were having um, a lively discussions. Okay. 
The Ephesus church were fighting and they were in danger of separating, breaking up their relationships with each other because of it. But Paul says it's like love, like care, and, you know, they have to be one. And when I say those words, love, care, you've got to be one, you need to make this action as if you're hugging someone. Okay, here we go, read, love, ah, or care. Don't you do it too? And then, what was the other one? Ah, to be one in Christ. Ah, okay. <laughs> so we're not supposed to be fighting. We're supposed to be loving each other. It's the Ephesus church to love ah, each other, not fight. Okay. Now, the way that he says to do that, though, Paul says... That the Christians should uh, to stand against the devil is to have you don't do this action. This is just for me to do. Okay, you are to have the ready feet to stand up against uh, the devil, stand up against sin. Okay, so that okay to kick the fighting out. You got to have ready feet to kick out the people who are doing the wrong thing in church and you know causing all this stir for no reason. You also have to have ready feet to kick out all those acts, those sinful acts that you do so you can follow God, okay? And, you know, that wasn't just for the Ephesus church, Jonah. That was for us too. That's for people who follow Jesus to kick out sin and to love one another, ah, okay? So if you are deciding to become a Christian, okay, any of you kids out there who are deciding to become a Christian, part of what that means is to have the ready feet to kick out the sin in your life, um, to love God, ah, and to love each other. Ah. Okay, so let's pray about that. This world that can take us away from you. But Lord, we, we do pray that um, you know, be with the kids today, that you might help them to remember uh, what it means to be a Christian. If they're coming, wanting to know you, then part of that is to um, have the ready feet that is to serve you and to be quick to run away from uh, the sin, to stand up to the devil um, and to uh, follow you and to love uh, your people. And we uh, do pray for them this morning as they walk, walk out of here. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jared. Uh, it is time now for the congregational prayer. Uh, I've got a list of prayers in the uh, roots, particularly of Bithy Asanti, as she's still recovering from a shoulder uh, surgery uh, because of the the uh, the virus and all that. She hasn't started her physiotherapy yet, so it's really being prolonged time of recovery. Uh, we're going to pray for the youth group and also for the Sunday school. Sunday school. Is there any requests for prayer? Any other requests for prayer? All right. Okay. Uh, in our um, prayer time before the service. A request. Yes. Sorry. A request from Kerry. So what? Pray for our brothers and sisters. Again, please spell A L A Allen. Oh, Allen and his wife Katie Kilborn. Okay. Pray for their strength. Um, they've been uh, missing fellowship, um, so please. Um, then both of them are not well just to give them support and peace. And also pray for Ian and Gail, the same. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah we'll pray for them. So we're praying for Alan and his wife, Ian and his wife, and for his strength. Fantastic. All right. Uh, in, in the... Uh, the group of people who usually join me uh, prior to the service and we spend some time of prayer, we have, a, we have a theme taken from Psalm 34, verse 15. 
I'm sure Ben would remember the verse. My friend Ben finds it hard to remember uh, verses. All right, the verse says, the eyes of the Lord on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. And we do believe that, that God is so interested in our lives and he hears the prayer of those who really, honestly, sincerely seek him. And the others, we quote the Bible and we explain that answering prayer is conditional. So it's only for those who really seek God from their hearts. But he is a good God. He listens to our prayer. So let's, let's uh, pray together for uh, those uh, points we, we just read. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you once again that we can talk to you. And we thank you. Thank you, Lord and Father, you listen to your children. And Lord, we pray for those sick amongst us. We know at least one who is a bitty asante, Lord, we continue to pray for her recovery. We continue to pray that you may lighten her pain. And uh, Lord, we pray that she will be well soon. Lord, we pray for anyone else who are not feeling well amongst us. Lord, we also bring it before you our youth group. Lord, we pray for the youth in our church that you may watch over them, protect them, Lord. And Lord, we pray that the time they spend together at church on Fridays will be time really to, uh, to hear the good news of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for the leaders that they really uh, communicate clearly the message of Jesus to those young people. Lord, we also uh, bring it before you the Sunday school kids and the teachers. Lord, we pray that you send more families to our church with more kids. So, so kids, they grow to know to know you and know your word. Lord, I pray for the ones we have here, the few ones we have here in our church that you watch over them. Give them, Lord, to grow in the knowledge of Jesus. Lord, we also pray for the Sunday school teacher that you anoint them with the Holy Spirit and to teach the kids uh, with excitement and eagerness. We pray all that in Jesus' name. And also, Lord, I mentioned to, uh, to ask you, Lord, for um, uh, Alan and his wife, Ian and his wife, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you be with them, um, help them, Lord, strengthen them physically and spiritually, that they can be well enough to, to join us when they can. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I think uh, we have Bible prayer, uh, Bible reading, uh, Bible reading, uh, Betty is doing the reading, and followed by Greg, he's is going to deliver the sermon today. Thank you, Betty. Two, two Bible Good morning, everyone. I have two Bible readings today. One is from Psalm. Chapter 51, verses 1 to 4. Verses 1 to 4. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfaith. Here. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. transgressions and have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge and the next reading is from John chapter 20 
reading from verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And that's the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to all you out to speak to us through his word. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We ask that you would speak to us through your word, that you would reveal new things and that we would be able to meditate upon them and apply them to our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For all you who go to Bible study, you'll know that when you answer some of them, no answer. And when I'm chatting to Ibrahim, he thinks that I'm very good at confusing him. So I'll try and keep up with that today. When I was doing uh, my research, I came across an article on the internet. Who has heard of a, a a statement, it's not a, it's not a really common um, statement. And in Australia, it's probably kangaroos or wombats or something like that. But I guess in America, um, it applies to deer. So I thought it would be an interesting article to read out. And it goes like this. Deer caught in the headlights is a phrase few of us have actually experienced. Though most of us have seen in those yellow road signs warning of deer crossings. But many years ago, as I, and I drove carefully. On several occasions, large green eyes reflected car headlights in wide-eyed fear. I have no idea why there were so many deer crossing the high experience and an illustration of what the phrase deer caught in the headlights actually means. A deer is blinded by sudden and unexpected light, disorientated and dismayed, not understanding the danger, not knowing whether to run or freeze the wrong decision, even indecision, could be deadly. As I consider this catechism question, those deer come to mind. To escape danger, they need the right information, understanding, and the ability to take proper action. Of course, they possess none of this. For us, the illustration should be clear. God has made a way for us to escape the impending destruction which our sins deserve. If we ignore that provision, we assuredly face death when we are caught in the headlights of God's truth and ultimately justice, word, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to enlighten our understanding and move us towards his saving grace. The question is whether we will heed the message or suffer what will surely come if we don't, our friends, that we would learn and diligently apply this lesson in faith and repentance. May we who call upon Christ for salvation make ongoing use of the means of grace towards the benefits of redemption secured by our loving Saviour. And that was written by a man called Joe Logides, who was a ruling elder emeritus, Orthodox Presbyterian Church. 
He's currently retired after 45 years um, in operations management, and most recently, nine years as the principal of Covenant Christian Academy in Westminster, California. Today, we're continuing in the catechism, the shorter catechism questions. I've got three questions to deal with today from 86 to 88. The first question, what is, what is faith in Jesus Christ? The second question, what is repentance unto life? And the third question, which I was only going to gloss over, but after reading, I thought it needed a little bit more. Question 88, what are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? Thanks, Damien. So, faith. Before we can answer that, but if I recorded it. Faith, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Before we can answer this question, we need to understand what faith or specifically Christian faith is. Faith, what is it? Have you ever given it much thought? Is it a feeling or is it knowledge? Where does it come from and how do you get it? These are the sorts of questions you'll have if you think about it. Faith is a reasonably common word and I think it's a word we use without really understanding what it is. And does it have more than one meaning? It's a word commonly associated with religions, such as Buddhism and Hinduism. In religion, um, in, in that context, it refers to a belief system. What people have faith in is wide and buried. For instance, I believe and have faith that the sun will come up every morning and every other morning and go down in the afternoon. That if I sit in a chair, it'll support my weight. People have faith in all sorts of things. They uh, have faith in people, their doctors. They have faith in, in, in uh, people believe and have faith that if they break a mirror, they'll have seven years bad luck. People also have faith um, in idols, false gods, some people have faith that if they live a good life, don't do anything wrong and don't hurt anyone, that they'll go to heaven. And I think that they believe that with all their hearts. These sorts of faiths are formed from knowledge, experience and reasoning. But are they always right? The answer to that is a resounding no. They are most certainly not always right. And like I said, people, people have faith um, that they're going to go to heaven. And we know um, from God's word that that's, that's not always right. So 
So now we must ask the question, what is the difference between this faith and Christian faith? What makes one right and one wrong? After all, everyone thinks that theirs is the right one. How can we be sure? I have concluded that our faith has everything to do with Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Ordinary faiths that people have in various forms all come down to human wisdom and understanding and plain old wishful thinking. It might be right or it might be wrong. And I say might because it can also depend on circumstances. Take the chair, for instance, that I used as an example. If I sit on it and it's been damaged in any way, I could end up on my backside on the floor. Where does that leave my faith based on my own wisdom and understanding? Whereas our Christian faith is the gift of the sovereign God, creator of all things. Faith is not believing, it's not trusting, and it's not hoping. Faith is much more than these things. Faith is complex. And I can only describe it as an ability, an ability which God provides to his people to draw on the knowledge and wisdom of who God is, his character, through his word and by his spirit, to believe all his fulfilled promises throughout the ages and to trust him to complete his unfinished work in us, hoping for the unrealized promises through Christ and relying in him alone for salvation and eternal life. And that brings me to the first reading. Or oh, the second one, as Betty read them out. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. These verses are 100% true, but only through God's provision, the ability to believe, the ability to trust, and the ability to hope, which is God's gift to us, and it's called faith. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So the answer that the Shorter Catechism gives is to whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. Moving on to the second question, what is repentance unto life? 
Repentance, what is it? Have you ever given it much thought? Is it a feeling or is it knowledge? Where does it come from? How do you get it? Haven't you heard the saying, don't reinvent the wheel? I thought that it was an appropriate way to start, apart from a little bit of humour. Faith and repentance. Now, this is for Ibrahim, just to confuse him. Faith and repentance, although being different, are the same in some respects. Besides, all the topics we speak about need to be given much thought. For instance, when I was researching, I came across these two verses. Acts 17.30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. But if we go back to Acts 11.18, we read, When they heard, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So what's that all about? Have we got a contradiction? James 1, 16 and 17 says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters, Ever coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. If every good, if everything good is a gift from God, then doesn't it stand to reason that repentance, like faith, is a gift from God? But notice, it's so easy to fall into the trap. So God wants me to repent. Okay, I repent. I'm sorry. So that's on me, not on God. He desires it, but I'm the one, me, 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 who does it. Wrong, wrong, wrong. needs what could I possibly have to bring to the negotiating table we know that God created all things that he makes everything and it's his and we just read that all good things are the gift of God which like faith must include repentance In 2 Samuel 24, David goes up to buy a threshing floor because Israel are under a plague. So he goes up to Arana to buy the threshing floor. And Arana says to David, No, my king, this is paraphrasing, No, my king, you can have it. I'll even throw in the ox. And for you to, David says, No, I won't sacrifice to God that which costs me nothing. Now, after just reading that everything belongs to God, I was wondering where David thought the money came from, which he was going to pay with. But that's another story. The reason I'm ample an insight into repentance, which is our second reading, Psalm 51, 1 to 4. Have mercy on me, O God, 
according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. For I know Am I trans against you? You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. David can see himself for who he really is. And he is repulsed and ashamed of what he sees. So when God grants Repent. In our natural state, we are rebellious, proud, arrogant, and totally self-absorbed. We don't know and don't want to know anything different. But God, who is rich in love and mercy, grants us the ability to see our sin for what it is. And like David, we should be loathed by it. forgiveness of our saviour. Repentance has never been to stop doing bad things and start doing good things, as some people think. Repentance is turning away from ourself, turning to God, because we're broken and he is the only one who can fix us. Repentance and faith are like two sides of a coin. You can't have one without the other. You can't have faith without repentance. And you can't have repentance without faith. The gift of God is the ability to believe, trust and hope in the gospel message and to see our sin for what it is. turning us from our self-centeredness back to God. I've been talking about faith and repentance, and these are gifts which God works in us inwardly through the Holy Spirit. Now we come to the last question for today. What are the ordinary external ways that Jesus uses to bring us the benefits of redemption? of redemption are what are benefits benefit is defined as an act of kindness or favor given and another word that's derived from benefit is beneficial which comes from that same word which means to do good to be useful or profit as what is redemption. We probably all know what these words mean, but they're important. And I don't want to take it for granted. Redemption comes from the word redeem, which simply means the action of regaining something or gaining possession of something for a payment or clearing a debt in Christianity. by God's plan of redemption for his world. Jesus taught two short parables that emphasize the value of eternal life and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. pearls 
When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. And you can read those in Matthew chapter 13, 44 and 46. Like hidden treasure or a pearl of great price, admission to the kingdom is of incalculable worth. And it is Jesus who grants the admission through redemption. In Philippians 4.19, we read, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Christians can miss out on a lot of benefits of redemption simply because they don't know. Did you know that we have every Every spiritual blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Or did you know that God has given us the knowledge for everything that we need for life and godliness? Listen, it's right here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has... has granted to godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And listen to this, James 1.55, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generally, generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. The benefits of redemption that I think this question relates to is mainly faith and repentance. But in the Bible, there's so much more. It's a bit like when people switch employment all the time or have lots of bank accounts. Over time, funds and and accounts ends up with all these unclaimed superannuation and bank accounts because when we move on from job to job we don't take that particular superannuation with us you go to a new company and they start up a new superannuation with another company and maybe they they open up new bank accounts and that to put your wages into and all that sort of thing and these accounts just get misplaced and from time to time on the news on telly they'll say oh you might be able to To get a win, you might have misplaced accounts. We can go through life suffering all sorts of trauma because we don't understand or just don't know what God has done for us. The outward and ordinary way that Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinary. all which are made effectual to the elect for salvation. That's the official answer to that question. Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in In your hearts. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Mark 11 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours.
When we share increments, we're talking about the Lord's Supper, communion, baptism. When we share in the sacraments, it is obedience to God's word. We also encourage one another in our faith and reflect on what God has done for us through Christ. And if we go back to benefit, we can be beneficial to one another. Now, the official answer was um, benefits of redemption are his, the way, the way Christ uh, communicates the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, sacraments and prayer. I would say we should also include ourselves in that. When we pray through faith, we are in communion with our Heavenly Father. Imagine that, being in communication with God. And we know that he hears and answers us. The Word of God, the Bible, the New Testament, the Gospel message, is the external ordinary way that Jesus communicates the benefits of redemption to us. How can we... No, the benefit, if we're not told, or even if we don't listen when we are told, God has provided absolutely everything we need for eternity with him. Faith, repentance, salvation, knowledge, wisdom, his son, and you. Which brings me back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Let's pray. Your word is so rich, and we thank you for it. Lord, we thank you for the benefits of redemption. We thank you for faith. We thank you for repentance. And we thank you for your spirit that makes them available to us. Lord, we pray that we would be convicted We pray that we might be beneficial to one another and profit one another by continuing to love you and love each other. Lord, we pray that we might be, bring glory to your name through the lives that we live. And we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Greg, for... Uh what you shared with us today. Uh, a lot has been shared. I think I have to listen to it again to absorb all this. But I learned lots of things. I learned it or being reminded of the goodness of God that uh, every, every good thing comes from him. And that includes our faith. Our faith in him. Um, so we thank you for that, uh, Greg. And uh, remember, uh, right at the, at the back there, there is a box. If you don't uh, transfer your offering and you put it in an envelope, you put it there like myself. So remember that it is there. So let me pray to conclude the service today. Lord God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. It is always encourages us.
So it reminds us again that by nature, we are sinful, we can't do anything good. And uh, it is your mercy upon us by which we can have faith and can repent and return to you. So Lord, we thank you for all this. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, conclude our service with the uh, grace. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Have a good week.